So we're going to start this uh, session. Uh, welcome, welcome to this uh, kind of a, a little bit of an original type of different session. Uh, I'm Pierre Fizet, I'm a anesthesiologist uh, here in Montreal. Uh, I'm filling in for uh, Dr. Danish Kumar, who has uh, and experienced uh, with the Montreal food and some of its uh, contaminants also. So he's uh, <laughs> unfortunately uh, taking care of himself today and uh, cannot uh, attend uh, this session. So I'm here because uh, I am uh, 25 years ago I was in the same lab as Talmadge doing my fellowship in clinical pharmacology and uh, we bumped into each other like at noon and he says you know I have a problem you know will you help me doing this? And I said fine. So Talmadge and I go back a long way and uh, are good friends. Uh, so that's why I'm here. Uh, this is going to be a very interactive session. Uh, we know some people in the room, so if there's an, uh, not enough questions, we will get to you and uh, get some, uh, some questions here. I see John at the back, and uh, you know, you'll, you're going to be prompted. <laughs> uh, OK, and without any more delay, I will uh, leave the podium to Talmadge, who has the material for about a week worth of uh, teaching here. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Well, thanks very much, Pierre. Uh, I want to really thank Pierre for standing in for Dr. Dinesh Gupta. Dinesh called me about 90 minutes ago and said, I just can't come. I, I, I've got such bad uh, gastrointestinal flu. And uh, Dinesh and I had, had met and discussed how we would structure this session. It was actually proposed by Dr. Gupta. And the idea is that it's to be a fireside chat where we have sort of a structured interview. And we're going to cover topics with a little bit of didactic, so a few slides, four or five slides on each topic, and then we'll just uh, answer questions. Um, and what we're hoping is that we'll have some interest from the audience and that uh, we can call on you to, uh, to ask some questions as well. And uh, I want to point out that, uh, that Dr. Fisset is a, a recognized expert in uh, TIVA and clinical pharmacology, had the same sort of research training that I have. And so I'm sure that uh, Pierre will want to uh, add to the discussion. And there are experts in the audience that might also want to, to chime in. We don't know exactly where this will go. And so we've got a lot of material just hyperlinked in a presentation so that we can jump uh, from topic to topic depending on the interests of the, of the audience. We thought we would begin with a very brief uh, introduction to sort of frame the discussion. Uh, and this is coming from a presentation that I gave uh, some years ago in, uh, at the International Society for Anesthetic Pharmacology annual meeting just a couple of years ago now. Remind you that I come from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. This is our hospital with the beautiful Wasatch Mountains in the background. This is about what it looks like right now at dusk. Still got lots of snow in the mountains, but uh, there are green uh, leaves on the trees, and it's a beautiful place to live and work. This is the time of year that you can uh, go skiing in the morning and play golf in the afternoon, just so that you can say you did that in one day. So it's a beautiful place to, to be. Uh, I have a couple of conflicts. I don't actually know that we'll get to these, but I thought it was important that I mention them. One is that I'm a consultant to Aries Pharma, which is uh, the developer of uh, Remy Maslam. And I'm also a founding partner of a company called MedViz, which has a technology that we might discuss as well. So really, we're going to talk about how intravenous anesthesia represented by the syringe and, uh, and vapor or inhalation anesthesia represented by the mask, how do they stack up if they were to get in the ring and uh, spar together? So my overall goal today really is to make the case that Advances in TIVA practice have really made it uh, possible to, to do TIVA as a really attractive and viable alternative to inhalation anesthesia. So here's how we want to frame the discussion. Gaining access to the circulation through the lung affords some very significant advantages. And uh, I think I'm going to just walk among the audience now that I've got a, a, I've got a remote advancer here. Uh, and I'll have to return to the podium on occasion to, to do some things. But So let's think about how anesthetics through the lung 
using a, a vapor, how they differ from anesthetics that are uh, undertaken directly through a vein. So this is a cartoon that I had drawn all the way back in the mid-1990s. And it was for the occasion of one of the very first talks I gave as a junior professor uh, at the what was then the Society for Intravenous Anesthesia. It was a very fledgling new uh, group of, of people that had come together to, to figure out how to tackle the problems that TiVo was facing. And my job was to, in this particular talk, was to sort of contrast TIVA versus inhalation anesthesia and talk about the challenges that were faced. So let's think about this for a second. When you gain access to the circulation through the lung, you got a very unique situation. You have a, an equilibration process that takes place. And that means that by using an agent-specific vaporizer for the delivery, uh, you're able to actually set an upper limit above which the partial pressure, the concentration, cannot rise. And that is a very distinct advantage. And in addition, you've got the ability to show that, OK, I've set a, some type of pharmacokinetic target with the vaporizer. And I can turn around and see with expired gas monitoring that that target has been hit. And in addition, back in the 90s, uh, we had very good understanding of what the target should be. Every anesthesiologist thinks in terms of MAC fractions or MAC multiples for a given patient, a given anesthetic technique in a given operation. So this equilibration process is a real plus because it makes it possible to set this concentration limit and it makes it so we can practice in the concentration domain. Now what about intravenous anesthesia? This is interesting to think about this um, again back in the 1990s when TIVA was just getting going. So. What's the difference? Well, you gain access to the circulation directly. And so without the aid of a computer model, you don't have any idea what the resulting concentration is. So uh, the delivery is not quite as, as exact. And of course, uh, you can't turn around and confirm that you've hit a target. And back in the 1990s, we didn't know what the target should be. And so we had all of these problems that uh, we had to overcome. And this was the status quo uh, at the early sort of stage of, of TIVA. So really what this session is about is how much progress have we made in trying to put a, a smiley face on that guy right there uh, as he's trying, he or she is trying to do uh, intravenous anesthesia. OK, so what are, the, what are the solutions? Well, one of the things that you can do, uh, it, it, one of the things that you can't do anything about is that you can't change the way we gain access to the circulation. So that, that's just the way it is. But we now have uh, some real advances in the delivery system. So we have target controlled infusions, and we'll talk about that. And we also have a lot of decision support, a lot of guidance systems that are available. Many of these are now available on apps, which are quite convenient to use. And then we have a bunch of, uh, whoops, we have a bunch of uh, additional tools. So we have advanced kinetic concepts. We have new pharmacodynamic concepts. We have more responsive drugs. And then finally, um, we can actually now measure propofol in the expired gas, which is something that's an experimental technique now. But all of these advances collectively have made it quite possible uh, to, to do TIVA in a way that rivals and in many ways surpasses inhalation anesthesia. So let's now, uh, with that sort of framework, with that uh, way of launching the discussion, let's jump into some of these, these topics. And the topics that we have in mind to talk about are kind of represented by these pretend covers. Uh, I actually had these covers drawn, so they didn't actually ever exist. Uh, but I had these covers drawn to symbolize some of the advances that, that we've been able to achieve in total intravenous anesthesia. Uh, as you know, advances don't come all in one, in one package. They accumulate over time. And so we never had cover stories that, that were dedicated to these, these topics, but we'll try to cover some of these today, depending on, on where the discussion goes. So, Pierre. Have a seat. <laughs> so, not surprisingly, your 
your, your historic review of what happens dates back to the 1990s or early 1990s. There's one good reason for that, is that at that time we had this new drug that was called propofol that came on the market. And uh, what I would like you to do now is to tell us uh, if we would even be here today discussing Tiva if it were not for the introduction of propofol in practice. So that's a very interesting question. I'd be curious to Thank know what... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be curious to know what John Sear thinks about that. Uh, <laughs> would we be having this discussion without the advent of propofol? And so that's our first sort of faux uh, cover yeah. here. And uh, let's talk about that for a second. You may know that you know, propofol is a very simple molecule, this, uh, this 2 6 diisopropylphenol. It's what I think is, can fairly be called the, million, or the billion dollar solvent because it's been, uh, as, an, as an anesthetic, a tremendous success. Even in, in its generic age now, it still has a significant income stream. And you know, you can buy this from Sigma Pharmaceuticals in a, in a little bottle. That bottle is on my shelf in my office. Uh, and that's enough to anesthetize a lot of people. But the problem is, its delivery is really difficult. So if you, if you take this bottle and you dump it out, it looks like this. This is actually, we've done a lot of work with um, alternative propofol formulations, almost all of which are trying to get away from the lipid component. And uh, this is just illustrating during one such study how immiscible propofol is. So this is the propofol layering out in a beaker of water in our, under a hood. Uh, in our investigational pharmacy. And you can see that it, it, you know, this propofol looks like corn oil and it's about that thick. And so delivering this stuff is really a problem and that was the key issue that uh, the, the developers face is how do you formulate this so that it uh, can actually be delivered uh, reasonably. And this was the first paper uh, by uh, Ian Glenn um, who really, uh, we'll say a little bit more about him in a moment, this was the first paper uh, that, that, that Ian put forward showing that you can put this in, an, in a lipid formulation. It's very similar to the uh, lipid component of total parenteral nutrition. And this proved quite workable. And it's interesting to note that Ian Glenn really did this kind of on a shoestring budget uh, as a side project in his lab at ICR Pharma in the UK. And he was indomitable. It had originally been formulated in something called cremophore, and it had a lot of allergic reactions associated with it. And so Ian Glenn, knowing that it had some very important uh, hypnotic properties, just kept working at it. And ultimately, a, a propofol in a lipid microemulsion proved workable. Uh, just a shout out to, to Dr. Glenn. Uh, his name is John, but he goes by Ian, and many of us uh, in the Tiva community have known him for many years. Uh, he is a, the son of a Scottish dairy farmer who received a degree in veterinary medicine and then uh, became essentially a veterinary anesthetist and was very interested in developing new anesthetic compounds. And just last year, he won the, uh, the DeBakey Lasker Award, which is one of the biggest honors that a person can uh, receive in clinical medicine. And so that, that was a real honor for the anesthesia community that Dr. Glenn uh, was, was honored in this way. If you're interested in all the alternative propofol formulations that are out there, this is an editorial uh, that discusses some of the formulations that are, that are still, some of which are still in development. There are all kinds of interesting things going on. Biosurfactant, nanoparticles, um, other kinds of lipid, but most of these are focusing on life that's beyond the Milky Way, right? Because a lot of the problems associated with propofol are actually a function of the lipid emulsion. So I, I guess the, the, the answer to the question, I've got to get up here to the hyperlink, the answer to the question, would we be here without the advent of propofol, I think the answer is no. I think without propofol we wouldn't be. So maybe there's some questions now. Anybody wants to comment on uh, this topic? I'm curious to know if, uh, if Dr. Sear in the back, our uh, Oxford professor, uh, wants to share anything about Ian Glenn. Yeah, I mean, I think, sorry, I should have um, 
Um, Maybe let's have you stand, John. And there yep. is a the, the mics are, are set to to capture this on the recording. But oh, we need to record it. You need to record it. Yeah. Okay. And you're okay from there as long as you just project as best you can. He's got you. Um, let me put it into perspective. In 1975. Uh, we started to develop the concept of intravenous anesthesia using a previous drug that was around in the United Kingdom. The drug had never made it to the States. It just about made it to Canada. Alpha teasing? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and the first propofol formulation was, in fact, studied in Belgium by uh, George Rolly, who was the professor at Uvain, and Brian Kay, who was a, an expat from Britain who had gone to work in Belgium. You can find uh, the description of these first, I think it's about six patients who were anesthetized by uh, George and by Brian, and Talmadge is right. It was sort of made up in a pretty hodgepodge solution initially of Cremafor, plus or minus alcohol. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to work out that the formula, the, that initial formulation was painful. Uh, there were problems with stability of the solution. There were problems of storage. And in the way of storage, which we we'll, might come back to later, but emulsions, lipid emulsions, attract bacteria, attract bugs, and are great for growing organisms. <coughs> so the, the, the first dose of the present formulation um, came online in 1983. Um, now, some of you will know the story. Um, I, I, in fact, did not give it. My registrar gave it. I stood there with a syringe of thiopentone, wondering whether it was going to work. Um, and I'm delighted to say that the hospitals in Oxford have lost the anaesthetic record of that occasion. <laughs> uh, which is a shame, because it, it, it is, I think, a historic um, occasion. I'm going to go back to Ian Glenn for a minute. We, we should remember during this story that Ian comes into this picture as, first of all, as a, farm, as a, as a, uh, a veterinary surgeon towards sense purposes. He then opts to go into, uh, into pharmacology, but not content with that, Ian, as Thomas will know, Pierre will know, led much of the early development of this drug from a position of being a veterinary, veterinary uh, physician. The fact that we got as far as we did probably arises because he uh, spotted the problems, thought he could solve them all, or they could be solved, and then had a team of supporters who went about and did it. Uh, now, Talmadge may not have been, were, were you in Vienna? Yes. There was, <laughs> you, can, you can remember Vienna, can you? Sure. Good. A lot of people can't, um, for other reasons. <laughs> he wasn't quite as famous yet. Pardon? He wasn't quite as famous yet. No. The, the whole strategy was that there was a development program which uh, undertook, was undertaken in Europe. I don't think Canada had got it by that point. Yeah, no. And at the European Congress of 19... 86. It was basically three years of clinical research was put into a symposium to launch the drug. Um, the interesting thing is how many patients received it by that time. And it was actually considerably more than would now be required by most drug regulation authorities. I have a feeling it's 3,700 and something. I wasn't, if I'd been told I was going to do this, you know, half an hour before I know, it's totally the right answer. But 
at that point, nobody had worked out what Telmogen started by, which is this way of delivering the drug by continuous technology. Mm -hmm. So the initial, the initial studies were all single bolus or multi -bolus. And it really, I guess, the drug took off because of A, it was a suitable drug, which appeared not to be cumulative on multiple dosing. It was occurring at the same time as the technology for understanding pharmacokinetics was being elaborated. And more importantly, the technology for delivery systems was being uh, enhanced. I guess we can see that. Drug development at that time was very different yes. from, <clears throat> from the whole era we were trained into, like in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Those principles that we will get to a little bit later uh, were, were just in their infancy at, at that time. So thank you, John, for this uh, you know, very, much, very uh, intimate perspective. Uh, on, on the development of, of Propofol and, it, and its uh, introduction. Now, tell me, how does that drug work? So this is another uh, topic that maybe is not that interesting from a, a, a clinical perspective, but I do think it represents a real, um, it represents a real triumph of molecular biologists in, uh, in, in anesthesia. And so it's worth just <clears throat> talking about it briefly. Why does it matter whether we know where it works? Well, we can actually draw a lot of conclusions just by knowing the mechanism in terms of how it will interact with other drugs, uh, in terms of I issues that might impact its behavior if we know what receptor it's working at. So just a quick review of this. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping we might have a molecular biologist or a basic pharmacologist in the audience that could elaborate on this. But this is a hippocampal neuron strain for, stain for the, the GABA-A uh, receptor, which is the, the primary target of propofol. Remember that this is a ubiquitous uh, neurotransmitter uh, that's expressed in, in every neuron. And it is the primary neuro uh, inhibitory transmission system in mammals. And so uh, the way we've come to understand how propofol works uh, is through two, two different mechanisms, primarily through uh, uh, knockout animals and also in uh, cell culture where the, the receptor has been fiddled with. So this is a, a fascinating patch clamp study. And remember what a patch clamp study is, is you can take a, a micropipette into a single neuron and these are usually in cells and culture and you can, uh, then, you can then measure the electrophysiologic activity within the cell. This was such an important method by the way that the developers won a Nobel Prize uh, some decades ago for the development of the patch clamp concept. So here's, here's the normal cells in culture. Um, and that is that if you give a little GABA, you get a little, a, a little current flow that is a function of the chloride flux. And if you add propofol, you get a lot more. So here we see in the normal situation, in the normal cell, the propofol is enhancing the inhibitory neurotransmission of, uh, of GABA, meaning that the, the cell has a lot of chloride flux and that hyperpolarizes it and makes it so it's less likely to fire and convey uh, neurologic messages, essentially. Now, if you mutate that cell with just a single amino acid at the putative binding site of propofol, you can see that uh, it still is responsive to GABA, but when you add propofol, it doesn't, it doesn't respond. Isn't that interesting? So this, are, this is cell and culture. Now the other uh, line of evidence is in knockout mice. So in the wild type, if you take a normal mouse, and this is also true for essentially all of our uh, sort of commonly used intravenous anesthetics, it's true for thiopental, it's true for etomidate, it's true for propofol. In the wild type, uh, you give some, uh, some propofol and you get hypnosis and immobility. Now, if you take a single amino acid on a subunit of the receptor and you change it out, just one amino acid at the putative binding site for propofol, you yield a mouse that has a, a 
really decreased hypnotic response and has no immobilization response to propofol. There are these fascinating videos of, of, of knockout mice getting an injection of propofol and not responding, not doing anything to it. It's really interesting. So, uh, you know, again, this is a real triumph of molecular biology and anesthesia, and I think something that uh, it's nice to know uh, how these drugs are working. And one of the unique things about TIVA is that the, the mechanism is quite specific. The inhaled agents hit a lot of receptors, and that makes it, uh, you know, a little messier in terms of predicting how they will behave. So that's a unique aspect of, of the TIVA mechanism. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there are any, any other insights from the, from the room here. I don't know if we have any basic pharmacologists who want to make a comment. Maybe not. Well, I certainly have a couple of slides oh, to one. show you of where it works. I'm absolutely not a basic pharmacologist, and unfortunately, I'm actually going to have to leave in a couple of minutes. So. But um, this business of receptors specificity, I work at BC Children's in Vancouver, so we're one of the few children's hospitals that does a lot of total injury anesthesia, at least in North America. Mm -hmm. And we've recently become interested in, or rekindled our interest in some of the work looking at um, interracial differences in protocol requirements for pharmacodynamic endpoints, stimulated by some work that Sam Lampertang and his group down in Florida were looking at in adults. And nobody's looked at this in children at all. Well, at least not very extensively. And we're lucky that on our side we also have a, um, a, a group of guys who are interested in adverse drug reactions and the pharmacogenetics of adverse drug reactions. So mm -hmm. we're about to, well, we're in the process of trying to design a study where we do some pharmacodynamic dose measuring in children, trying to work out how much we need to reach a certain pharmacodynamic endpoint at induction and then take some blood or some saliva and send it across the road to Bruce Carlton and his group for them to look at um, ancestral variation in uh, GABA-A subunit uh, polymorphisms. And I just wondered if uh, this is something that's very new to me. I'm kind of learning on the fly about a lot of this stuff, but I, I wondered if you had any insight into any work in that kind of area to explain some of the pharmacodynamic variation that we see. You're right that there's a lot of interest in this topic. I'm not aware of any, uh, any polymorphisms in the GABA-A receptor that have now been confirmed as a, a distinct uh, underlying cause of variability in the response to propofol. But there are definitely some unsolved mysteries out there. So the most obvious one, and it might be kinetic, it might be dynamic, so it might not have anything to do with the receptor. It might relate to the disposition of the drug. Mm -hmm. But the most obvious one is the fact that, uh, that men tend to wake up slower from propofol. And I don't know how many of you have had that experience. Just by show of hands, how many of you have had uh, you know, sort of distinctly prolonged wake-ups from propofol in, in males in particular. So it definitely, it definitely happens. This is especially true if you do a lot of TIVA because you're more likely to see some of the tail ends of the, of the distribution of, of normal. Um, at the University of Utah, we do about 50 to 60% of our cases by TIVA. So we do a mm -hmm. great deal of TIVA. I think we're the lead TIVA place in the United States. And, uh, and this is something that we do see with some frequency. So uh, John uh, alluded to the fact that uh, in the beginning, everything was done by uh, bolus injection. Uh, most of what we were doing was that way. Uh, but we slowly came into uh, the infusion technology and all that uh, in the form of what we call target controlled infusion. So we now have a target to aim at with propofol. So what's it all about? Can you explain what TCI is? What are the principles? Maybe we could ask, uh, to begin with, um, how many in this room are using TCI? If you're from Europe, then you're a TCI user. So we'd be very pleased to hear from you after we uh, just briefly uh, discuss what uh, TCI is. So you can see the target uh, that we, the, the faux cover that we developed here uh, to discuss uh, TCI. So this is essentially a vaporizer for IV anesthetics, although that's not quite right, is it? Because it's not physics. It's, it's a computer model. So it's a prediction as opposed to an actual 
uh, physical principle. But here is the first paper back in 1990 by Gavin Kenny, who I think we can uh, congratulate as really one of the key players in the, certainly in the commercialization of TCI. You can see the title here, Intravenous Propofol Anesthesia Using a Computerized Infusion Pump, published in the journal Anesthesia. So this is a, a, a quick sort of diagram of what TCI is. This is coming from a textbook that uh, Dr. Hugh Hemmings and I publish. And um, let's just walk you through it, because this is something that most Americans and most North Americans, uh, it's, it's available in Canada, although not widely used, so most North Americans know about TCI, but not quite sure exactly what it is, and, and we haven't been able to use it in a clinical setting. So uh, the user designates a target concentration to hit. So rather than a dose, you're practicing in the concentration domain. And so you, you set a target, and that instructs the, the pump to calculate the infusion rates that are necessary to hit that target based on a, a a mathematical solution to the pharmacokinetic model for the drug. Sorry, Thomas, that's concentration in the blood, right? That's right. Well, you can also, uh, you, so you can target either the plasma or the, the theoretical effect site, depending on what model you have to use, right? And this is one of the unique things. You have to be familiar enough with the literature to know what model is appropriate from the literature. So what, what model is going to be best for your patient? Um, so the, the, the pump calculates the infusion rate and then gives it to the, to the patient, the pump has to report back what it gave. Now, why is that? Well, it's because the pump can't perform exactly what it was directed to do. The pump has certain limitations, a maximum infusion rate and so on. So the, the pump, the computer algorithm will say, hey, I want you to give a bolus right now and then infusion like this and then a, start a new infusion at this rate. And the pump tries to sort of approximate those, those instructions. So it has to report back to the algorithm what the actual infusion was, and then the pump then can performs a pharmacokinetic simulation, that you get both a digital readout of the predicted concentration and a graphical uh, uh, <coughs> presentation of the concentrations versus time. And then based on three things, based on what the, what the Bayesian prior is, that is what the concentration should be, based on the literature, how the patient is doing, and the current concentration that's predicted, you use these three to adjust the target concentration. And this is a quite uh, interesting thing to do. You know, just as an example, if you were doing birth suppression for a neurological case and you had eight mics per mil of propofol going to, to create birth suppression, when the birth suppression uh, is no longer necessary and you say, okay, now I want to go back to three mics per mil uh, for a usual anesthetic state, and you, and you push go, the pump might be off for a half hour, right? That would be unusual. That would be unusual for Americans to tolerate that. <laughs> <laughs> but the pump is very courageous. So the pump will do it. So this is a picture of the first TCI system. This was called the dip refuser. Uh, you can uh, imagine why it was called that. And now uh, there are a whole variety of pumps available from a whole bunch of manufacturers. And uh, this is the worldwide distribution of TCI. And you can see that the United States is sort of the notable exception, and the interior of Africa. So kind of sad, actually, that we don't have TCI available. We don't have this tool. Uh, if you look at how it performs, this is what we used to call, in fact, uh, Pierre will remember this. What do we used to call these plots, Pierre? You can't remember. Well, it's after a, a famous German car. Oh, the BMW. Yeah, the BMW <laughs> plots. So when we were in the lab together, this was the best, the best, the median, and the worst, right? So the best, median, worst. And you can see that the, the line, this was a, for a TCI system for fentanyl, uh, so testing a model. You can see that the line is the targeted concentration, and the dots were actually measured concentrations in the blood. So you can see, on average, these systems do quite well. Uh, this is a little editorial that discusses why we don't have TCI in the United States. And Steve Schaefer and I published this uh, a couple years ago in an, an ANA issue that was focused on target controlled infusion technology. I'm very curious to hear from, uh, from some of the audience members about their experience with TCI. Maybe you could give us just a 30 second uh, overview of, of what you think of it, some of you that raised your hands. Go ahead and stand up and project as best you can. I'm Axel from Sweden, Stockholm, and this is 
Good morning, Rebecca. We both work in the same hospital. And uh, we have been using it for all kinds of surgeries and since a few years back, primarily for all our bariatric surgeries. Um, and uh, unfortunately, our third colleague who has been here had to leave this morning. He's, he's uh, keeping it, being kept up at night looking for the, the um, pharmacological reasoning of how to think of the TCI algorithms that are out there with the extreme BMIs, yeah. which, which I'm sure he would have been happy to discuss here today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be covered a little later, that's very yeah. much. But our, I mean, our experience is, is um, very positive with it. Mm -hmm. I've worked in three or four different uh, anesthesiology clinics in different hospitals in Sweden where it's been used ex extendedly. Uh, and all of them. Uh, I'm sure you've been in yeah. at least as many. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, recovered, um, what's it called? Wake up times are quite mm -hmm. predictable somewhat. Uh, I mean, we've, we've at the Horror Hospital also implemented the almost closed loop inhalational anesthesia, which makes uh, waking up quite, quite. Um, quick as well. Mm -hmm. So there isn't that much of a difference there. We're using extremely low flows. Yeah. But uh, yeah, positive experience. Very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing that. Any Thanks. any other comments yeah. about TCI? Yeah. Go ahead. So I just people will read the literature and will see lots of different pharmacokinetic kinetic models describing protein. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself why was this one chosen for this pump, this one chosen for that pump? And that's, that's a great question. question. Yeah, and, right. and we'll actually get to that a little later. In fact, maybe we can take it up as the <clears> next <throat> topic and talk about the impact of obesity uh, on, on, uh, on the disposition of drugs. But we had another and, comment. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tom Hackman, I recall signed away from Risk Columbia. I work on the other side of the coast. Uh, I showed up my hand for TCI, although we don't have a TCI pump, I use an app. Um, it's called ITGO Plus. Um, I have no commercial interest in it, but it works very well. So I, I'm putting a plug for this colleague of ours, you may know him from Columbia, yes. who developed it. And you're using it for decision support, basically. Right. So they tell, I let the app run, and it says, okay, now run propofol so much, or remifentanil, and it, it works actually very nicely. Um, so, it's a cheap man's alternative, and there's a disclaimer that says you're not supposed to use it, but it's good for teaching. You can show the resident, okay, this is what we're doing, and use the similar models and describe. Now, there's a, one th there's a couple of questions that I would like to address. Is uh, Number one is, yes, multiple models have been developed, and I think recently there was a consortium that people pooled all the data from all the available models and came up with a universal model. So do you have any comment on that? Which, because it seemed to work according to the publication very well. And the second, maybe you can talk a little bit about the difference between plasma concentration and effect cell concentration. Because before you spoke about, okay, uh, propofol occupies the GABA receptor or binds specifically. There's a great jump to think, I, I cannot say, we cannot measure the effect cell concentration. Or it is a virtual concentration. Concent yeah. And it's, it's an apparent concentration, yeah. What I'm saying is it's, most of the studies have been done using BIS monitors or similar monitors, and they have problems on, on their own. Yeah. And there is often this discrepancy be between what the effect side concentration says and what the BIS says, and so these two things are very Yeah, common. very interesting. We will, we will try to get to, to both of those topics, actually. I wonder, Pierre, if we should talk about the uh, impact of obesity now, since you've given us a nice segue to that. Um, yeah, well, sure, why not? Uh, maybe you can skip to the covariate uh, part. Yeah. It, it, would be, it would come nicely in, in the discussion right now. So we'll, we'll skip to this, this pretend cover down here, which is the idea of special populations. And uh, how do we handle the very young, the very old, the very large patient, and so on. And uh, it turns out that these models uh, are now accounting for many of these special populations in a, in a fairly uh, robust and uh, scientifically grounded way. So let's talk about the case of obesity. Um, and you alluded just a moment ago, our colleague from British Columbia, to the idea of these uber models, 
if we're going to use a, a, a German word to describe it. So this is the idea of pooling a bunch of pharmacokinetic studies to try to get more power. It's a little bit like a meta-analysis, only completely different. Uh, <laughs> by that I mean that you know a typical pharmacokinetic study has about 20 to 30 subjects in it. When you're doing mm -hmm. a, a, a really, let's call high resolution pharmacokinetic study where you're getting a lot of blood samples from each patient or each volunteer. And so one of the problems is you can usually build a model that describes the, the volunteers really well. But lots of times the volunteers uh, don't describe the population you want to use the drug in. Like an 80 year old, if the volunteers were 20. Or like somebody with a BMI of 40, if the vo volunteers had BMIs of you know, 25 to 27 or so. And so that becomes a real challenge. And this idea of the Uber model, pooling uh, data, has really attempted to address that. And we now have good Uber models for remifentanil and propofol. So let me take you through one of those. So this was, this was from our lab, actually. This is the work of Dr. Uh, Dr. T.K. Kim and Dr. Shinju Obara, who were both fellows in my lab, one from uh, South Korea and the other from Japan. So you can see we took all of these studies that were in the literature, and I, I knew all of these investigators, and I just asked them, will you give me your data, and we want to build a big model to try to look at the effect of age. Mm -hmm. And you can see, or weight rather, we, we looked at age too, but weight was our primary goal. And you can see that we, we this is the distribution of weight in all of these subjects, and um, you know, this is a pretty good distribution, and we had a study that had some big people, but what we didn't have were these really big people. And this came to us courtesy of Dr. Lacola in Italy, um, where they had, some or they had some patients that really liked their pasta. I think really what happened was they, this was probably coming from a bariatric surgery service. And so that's why they had a lot of these big patients. Anyway, so you can see that we've got these, we've got these big patients here, and this really allowed us to examine the impact of weight on the disposition of remifentanil. So this is showing the infusion rate versus time that's necessary to hit uh, a target concentration of 5 nanograms per mil. If you were doing remi by TCI, 5 nanograms per mil is a typical target. That's a therapeutic level of, of remifentanil. Now let's take the case of a young person who's 75 kilograms. And you can see that you need to give about 14 or so mics a minute to achieve this target concentration of 5 nanograms per mil. This should be mics per minute here, by the way, not mics per mil. So uh, 75 kilograms takes about 14 mics per minute after it's at steady state. One of the unique things about Remy is that it reaches steady state quite quickly. Now, let's take someone who weighs twice as much, 150 kilograms. Well, you can see that there's about a 25% increase in the infusion rate that's necessary. Not a doubling, not a 100% increase, but only a 25% increase. What this tells you is that if you're, just, if you're using a regular infusion pump with remifentanil and you put the actual weight in for somebody that's really big, it's going to represent a pretty substantial overdose. Now this is another way of looking at it. This is a, the cumulative dose versus time. So we're just going to look at the, the two conditions here, a 25-year-old that, that is sort of, of, of uh, lean weight, and then a 25-year-old that weighs 150 kilograms, so 100% increase in weight. You can see that after five hours, there's only about 25% more cumulative drug having been given. So this is the scientific foundation for adjusting our pumps for <coughs> for patients that have high BMI. You know, if somebody's a little overweight, you can just put their weight in. But if somebody's really overweight, you need to make this adjustment. And uh, I haven't put out the equation here, but if you want to have sort of a, a quick and dirty way to do it, the, the weight you should put into your pump is imagine or guess what the patient should weigh, and then figure out what, how much more weight they have, and give them credit for about a third of that. And that will be about right. So what's their ideal weight, what's their actual weight, and what's the difference? And give them a dosing that's their ideal weight plus a third of their body weight that's, that's, that's a bit higher. Go ahead. Could you not use BMI instead of weight and have that 
built into the algorithm. You could. Yes, you absolutely could. And it would, be, it would have been reasonable to decide, well, we're going to put BMI into the model. We actually decided to build the model with, with, the, with the patient's actual weight and then and let, the model, let the model do it from there. So, but that would have been a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And that's one of the things that's tricky about this is you have to choose what covariate you're going to use. Um, there are lots of different schemes that are out there. I'm happy to tell you that several of the pump manufacturers are now incorporating this model into their TCI systems. So the new TCI systems, at least from certain manufacturers, will have this model in it. It's going to be the Kim Obara Egan model. Um, but then you'll have to choose. But obviously, for overweight patients, this will be a good model because it, it, it accounts for it. Whereas, for example, the Schneider model, which is the model you guys are probably using in Sweden, the Schneider model is probably the one you're using in uh, British Columbia. The Schneider model doesn't account very well for weight because it, it was in, it was in uh, volunteers that all pretty much weighed a normal weight. You, you, you had a question. Uh, well, our friend from Sweden had a question. Oh, yeah. Then we're going to go back afterward. OK. I can, yeah, I can remember which, if it's the Minto for, for Remifentanil or if it's the Schneider for Propofol, those are the ones we use. And those are the main two drugs we use, or the only we use at the, at the moment for Tiva. But uh, if, or if it might even be both. But as far as I remember, the algorithms, the, one of them doesn't even account for height, which means it doesn't give a damn about BMI. Yeah. And the other, both of them, I think, has a cap on how high, uh, how much of a or heavy of a weight you can actually put in before it says no stop. Right. And the Minto one. No, it doesn't matter what you do, it still calculates a BMI or an ideal body weight or whatever. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, we reason the way that you consider what they should weigh. And, and just put that in. Yeah. Body mass. And I think that's so the right way to do it. And, and that's, I think with the current Minto model, that's a good way to do it. By the way, there's something very unique about the current Minto model. Charles is one of our very good friends. He was also in the same lab at Stanford. The problem with the Minto model is that it has a parabolic relationship uh, with uh, body weight and BMI, essentially. And these were some, from some faulty equations that were, that were inculcated into the literature way back when. So a guy named James was studying the relationship between lean body mass and total body weight. And he created this, this algorithm sort of assuming that there was a certain upper limit above which people wouldn't go. And, and then his equations were parabolic and started to come down. So in the mental model, as you get higher and higher weight, the, 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 the body weight actually, the, the BMI starts to come down. Uh, and so that's a, that's a real problem. The lean body mass starts to come down, and that's not true. And it, it was because of these faulty equations. So that's just a quick little nuance uh, about that. And that's why the machines won't let you put in this, this bigger weight. This model fixes the Minto model. We have all the Minto data plus a bunch of additional data. And Charles was very nice to provide. We had another question in the back. Another question in the back. So my name is David Well. I'm in the Air Force. And, I, and so this is interesting to me. 25 years old, 75 kilos. 25 years old, 150 kilos. Assuming that 150 kilos, that's adipose tissue mostly. And we're just sort of starting to hit on this su subject. But I take care of a lot of 25-year-old guys who weigh 110 kilos and are just strapping. Yeah. And I can tell you the amount of Remy fentanyl I have to give them blows my mind. Now, they might also be on steroids and other things because they're 25-year-old guys who want to be big and bold. So there's a, there might be some other confounding factors in there. But just anecdotally, I can say um, if I were to dose it kind of like you're suggesting, uh, you know, ideal body weight, what they weigh, one-third more, I'm having to give. I'm so glad you mentioned this. So, this is so lean versus, yeah. presentation. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think in these cases where, you know, you're looking at somebody and they are, uh, are, you know, their weight's pretty, they're, they're big, strong guys, but you can tell that they're lean. Use their, use their regular body weight. Yeah, absolutely. So in other words, there are some people that their ideal weight and their actual weight uh, misrepresents how much lean body mass they have because there are these young strapping Marines and Navy SEALs that they're, they're lean throughout even though they weigh more than uh, ideally they should, right? Yes. Go ahead. This seems it's just absolutely upside down for propofol. If I have a 150 kilo, 65 year old, and I and I treat him like this, I won't wake him up. Well, uh, I, I think the way I would answer that is the final little slide in this uh, in this little segment. Yeah, we can we can say actually that weight is one covariate that is used as an example here. But there's tons of other covariates 
age well, being one, you know? Drug, drugs, drugs, drugs specificity here. You've got a drug that absolutely goes away, and you've got another drug that is going to get in there and stay with you for a long time. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, that's a good point. And so <clears throat> Remy's not the same as propofol, but uh, the, I guess we, we focused on Remy fentanyl and obesity, but there is now an, an, what we can call an Uber model uh, for propofol as well. This was just recently published. It's by the group, of uh, Michel Struis group in the Netherlands. And you should take a look <clears throat> at this study, and it will give you some dosing re recommendations. And they are roughly, <clears throat> they, believe it or not, they're roughly uh, consistent with what I just told you for Remy fentanyl. In other words, the, the, uh, the bottom line is that obese people need more drug. They absolutely need more drug, but they don't need nearly as much as suggested by their total body weight. So take a look at this and, and see how you could weave that into your, into your practice. Go ahead, Eli. Uh, Eli Sarraf from Burlington, uh, Burlington uh, Vermont. Um, so Alvin actually has a BMJ model that kind of, is there some, I, even when I'm playing around with that model, there's some inconsistencies when you bolus the drug. Um, one issue that I have is whenever you pull the data, is that you're, you're assuming the data is all correct. And, and one thing that I've discovered maybe some five, six, seven years ago is that the infusion pumps that we used to use generate these models. Just because you hit on and start the infusion doesn't mean you're actually infusing it sort of right. And so you may, you may get error early on in, in how things play yeah. out. You get so there in the startup time of all these pumps and so on. So when you get it actually in the clinical domain, uh, it's not quite as precise, that's true, as the conditions that you have in these studies. I think we probably better move on, huh, Pierre? Yeah, well, 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 if we want to cover some of the topics that, that uh, actually would blend nicely with what we're saying, maybe step back a little bit and, and go over some of the PK and PD concepts that were alluded to by, by, by the audience. Uh, why are they unique to anesthesia? Uh, what's the effect site? How do you determine that? How do you rely on that to give your anesthetic, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, very good. So uh, several of, of, of our uh, audience have mentioned this idea about, uh, about the effect site <clears throat> and, and this idea of the, what's called the context-sensitive half-time. These are some unique concepts for anesthesiology. Um, I had this cover drawn to sort of point out that the pharmacokinetic principles that govern most therapeutic areas, like internal medicine, uh, prescribing a, an antihypertensive, uh, for example, they don't really work in anesthesia. This is especially true about what the half-life means. Half-lives, the terminal half-life doesn't mean much in our practice because the terminal half-life is really only lowering drug concentration after the outpatient uh, is, has been home for six hours, right? And the drug effect is long since gone. And so we had to develop kind of our own pharmacokinetic concepts. This was a very influential editorial in my career. It was published about the time that I was uh, sort of really starting to do my own research. This was back in the, in the uh, in the mid-90s. This was written by Dennis Fisher, who's a very accomplished pharmacokineticist at UCSF and a practicing anesthesiologist as well. And you can see that the title says it all. Almost everything you learned about pharmacokinetics was somewhat wrong. And that is, we need our own kinetic concepts. And I think the idea is that you can take a pharmacokinetic model and you can put it into some simulation software. And then you can take any dose of interest and you can make predictions about the plasma concentrations, the effect site concentrations, and effect that will result. And you can then draw clinical inference from that. So if we blow this, this up, what a good PKPD or kinetic dynamic model will do for us is that we can predict the plasma concentrations after a dose and we can predict the effect site concentrations after a dose. And these are sort of the mathematical forms that are used in these models, a bi-exponential equation and a differential equation for plasma and effect site. And then uh, we use a, an equation like this to describe this sigmoidal Emax curve for pharmacodynamics. So what this, what this tells us is what's the relationship between dose and concentration? And that's what pharmacokinetics is. By the way, I'm always telling our medical students and residents, look, you were taught in medical school that pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug, and that's a bad definition. You should get away from that. 
Um, pharmacokinetics is the relationship between the dose and the concentration. And then pharmacodynamics is not what the drug does to the body. It's the relationship between the concentration and the side of action and effect. So when we build these models, we can, we can do these kinds of simulations and draw clinical inference. What you can't do is look at a table of pharmacokinetics and say, oh, here's the central volume and here's the clearance and now I know how this drug is going to behave because these parameters interact in a very complex way. So this is the context-sensitive halftime and this is the paper that named it back in the, in the mid-90s. This was from the Duke group, uh, Peter Glass and those guys. Um, and the context-sensitive halftime is the, is the time that's required to achieve a 50% decrease in concentration after stopping a continuous infusion. So you can see why propofol became a popular drug for intravenous anesthesia and thiopental did not. Because for thiopental to get a 50% drop, it took, you know, after a number of hours, it took three hours for it to even drop by 50%. So it was, it was propofol's kinetics that were in part uh, the basis for its popularity as a TIVA technique. Now, why is this true? If we use the sort of the standard hydraulic model, which is an interesting way to think of this. So we've got the dose coming in from the faucet here into the central compartment. And this, this level right here is the concentration in the central compartment. Now, the drug can have two things happen to it. It can either be eliminated through clearance that, can, that means either elimination unchanged or biotransformation by the liver, for example. Or it can also be distributed to these other places in the body. Now, the problem with the terminal half-life is that it only accounts for this right here. It doesn't account for these things. And this, this distribution is, is still happening during the duration of most anesthetics. So here's another way of, of, uh, of thinking about it. Let's see. I wonder if I just ran out of batteries or, oh, there we go. I, was, I must have been out of range. Okay, so let's suppose, uh, just to jump back here a little bit, let's suppose that you finished your residency and you can't delay gratification any longer and you're going to buy a Porsche, okay? At least that's what happens in the United States occasionally. I don't know what they buy in other countries, but. So let's suppose you're going to spend 70K on this Porsche and the bank, because of your income potential, will loan you 50K at 10%, but no more. And you've got a, a rich uncle from Texas who's very proud of you, and he's going to give you 15K at 3%. And then you've got to go to a loan shark for the remaining 5K at 25%. That's a very creative financing arrangement. Is there anyone here who could tell me if we made a $1,000 payment a month, what would the balance on the 70,000 be? after a year. It's incredibly complicated, right? Three loans, three different starting balances, three different interest rates. And that's exactly what you have with the three compartment model. The only way you can understand this is with a computer. Computers do this stuff very willingly. They never complain. Um, and so this is what the, this is what the context sense of halftime is intended to do. It's doing a simulation to show you how the drug actually behaves because we can't figure it out in our heads. Now, what about the effect site? Well, this is the original publication back from 79 by Stansky and Shiner. So Stansky is the guy that, uh, he's the Canadian guy at Stanford that Pierre and I went to study with. It turned out that he was such a famous guy, he was always running around uh, giving talks and stuff. And so mostly <laughs> our mentor worried. was Steve Schaefer, um, who uh, really was the guy that we really trained a lot with. But Don really had a great influence on us as well. But it was Don and, and uh, Louis Shiner that developed this idea that uh, the, the drug is administered into this central compartment, but then it, it goes to where it works. And <clears throat> This is called the, this theoretical effect site, and it's the concentrations here that correlate with effect. It turns out it's very difficult to correlate plasma concentrations with effect for reasons that I won't bore you with, but the problem is, is that when you do a study, you might have four or five different levels of effect that, or, or four or five different plasma concentrations that have roughly the same effect associated with it. So it's very difficult 
to make a concentration effect relationship unless you, uh, you do this apparent effect site concentration thing. So this is a way that this kind of information is used in anesthesia. So this, again, is from uh, a textbook that Hugh Hemmings and I published. This is showing the percent of peak effect site concentration after giving a bolus at time zero for these various opioids. <clears throat> and this has tremendously important clinical implications, right? So for example, you can see why remifentanil is kind of dangerous by bolus as, in terms of its ability to cause apnea. Because within 90 seconds, you've got a peak level and you've grossly changed the relationship between CO2 and ventilation, right? Whereas with morphine, it takes you know, more than a half hour for it to get to a peak. And so morphine is actually, by bolus, is a little less dangerous uh, because it takes quite a while for it to peak. But you could argue that on this basis, morphine is a horrible PCA drug. Now, of course it works, and it's worked for a long time. But the danger is, if your lockout interval is 10 minutes, you might have three doses given before the first one has peaked. So I argue that, that um, fentanyl is really the, the best PCA drug because it peaks at about five minutes, which means that if your lockout interval is 10, you're pretty sure to have seen the maximum from the last dose before you authorize another dose. So there are all kinds of interesting clinical implications from this effect site concept. Even though you're right, somebody mentioned that it's, you can't actually measure it, right? It's an apparent effect site concentration. It's a prediction. But it's a prediction that, that takes into account the time lag between the peak plasma and the peak effect. Yeah, but what's, the, what's the effect? What do you, what, you measure it? So, yeah, that is an interesting question. And, and what, you're, what you've discovered with your TCI pumps is that it depends on what effect you're measuring. The, the parameter that characterizes that relationship is dependent on the actual effect, right? So it could be breathing. It could be the processed EEG. It could be unresponsiveness, like a syringe drop. And all of those effects are going to have a slightly different time constant. So that's why sometimes what you see in the prediction doesn't match what you're seeing clinically. You always have to remember that it's a model, right? It's like when we get a report back from our anesthesia workstation that we're at 0.7 MAC. What does that mean? It means that if this patient's typical, you're at 0.7 MAC. But right, it's a model. It's not that patient. And so you have to use clinical judgment to decide how close your patient is to the population model. You're always having to kind of make that decision. Comments, questions about some of those concepts? Go ahead. Oh, in the, in that, the, one thing that yeah. hasn't been mentioned here is that um, one of the f huge differences between TIVA and inhalational anesthesia is that in TIVA, these drugs have to be metabolized. And in inhalational anesthesia, <clears throat> the metabolism is a sidelight, basically, for the drugs that we're using now. Um, so that's one of the things that complicates this, I think, in, in one way. Uh, and, and the second impression, and, and, and just to be a devil's advocate, this sounds really complicated. Um, <coughs> turning on a vaporizer doesn't sound nearly so complicated. Um, and um, so there's got to be some benefit to doing this. I couldn't agree more. That um... There's something very simple and elegant about turning on a vaporizer. Not quite as intellectually interesting, um, but, yeah, but that's... you're right. You're right that it does simplify things, and in that sense, it makes uh, for a, probably a little less error, right, because it's, it's simple. Um, and you're also right that, you know, with, with TIVA, you, you really have to get smart about how the drugs are administered because you're relying on this passive process of metabolism for emergence. Whereas with the inhaled drugs, you really just have to, to blow them off, right? And so ventilation is sort of the main, main thing that, uh, that promotes emergence. Actually, any time Teddy Gear would attend one of our conferences on uh, TIVA, he would be laughing in the corner there saying. Yeah, that was one of his main points. It's so simple, you know? I actually debated Ted Eager at, at two uh, national meetings TIVA versus inhalation anesthesia. And he was a formidable debater. <laughs> in fact, I think it's fair to say he crushed me. Um, but he was very kind in the way he crushed me, very diplomatic. We have one question in, in the front there. 
from uh, what's your name? Your uh, yeah. Axel. Axel. Okay. Axel, go ahead, and then in the back we have two more questions. Not to uh, uh, only focus on the TCI um, topic, but I'm curious since since we are uh, well, the two of us at least mainly using it and and looking at uh, certain data on specifically bariatric surgery um, and being in Sweden where uh, we don't have the same panorama of obesity, extreme obesity, as in, uh, for example, the States. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to hear uh, from, from some of you who do work in, in uh, those parts of the world that also use uh, TCI models with, with the extreme cases, the triple digit BMIs, if there are anyone, any, if there is anyone that has any experience of... Well, <coughs> any comments on this? We yeah. work in the 70 to 80 range quite a lot. Mm -hmm. That's not, that, that, we don't have the, the ultra obese, but the 70 to 80 range, and, and we're, we're using an, an ERAS protocol involving lidocaine, ketamine, uh, not a lot of propofol, uh, a little bit of inhalational agent, and, uh, and trying to, to, to stay away from, from the narcotics as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're pretty successful with it. It's, it's, uh, those, those drugs seem to be a little bit friendlier than, friendlier than you might expect. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, that's another, another question would be to, to start looking at, at what people, at least in my favor reference office, think of as, as TIVA involving three or four drugs, not just two, uh, which becomes yet still more complicated. You mentioned uh, the elegance that, that Dr. E Eager spoke with. I, he, he at least is working at, you know, looking at turn the can on, turn the can off. And although there is some, some slop, certainly individual to individual in MAC, the slop for the narcotics and the, and the other agents that you're given here, you're given a, a very elegant presentation of, of these nice curves. That effect site still seems to be to be something that is extremely elusive. Yeah, especially, I think you're quite right that one of the advantages of inhalation anesthesia is that the therapeutic window uh, seems to be uh, seems to be tighter. That is, it's smaller, it's it's narrower, uh, and particularly for the opioids, there's a there's a broader therapeutic window, and that's kind of where the some of the art comes in, where your intuition about uh, how how to titrate the anesthetics uh, has to come into play. We had a couple of questions in the back there. Um, yes? This is from Turku, Finland. I, I think you are right in, in inhalation and anesthetics that it's so easy to adjust, but I've learned to use TCI the very same way. I put propofol with a constant, uh, constant uh, effect side concentration, and then I adjust remittently, and it's really fast and really adjustable. I feel like I'm using the same kind of system. Same concept. And that certainly is the idea that the TCI is intended to be sort of a vaporizer of yeah. sorts yeah, for the right. uh, TIVA drugs. One of the major, that, that, that's, that's so true. Uh, every time, every time you talk, we talk to Europeans, they say TCI is simple. You, know, you just press the button. You want five, it's five. Five, five of propofol, five of Remy. That's it. They, you guys use TIVA the way the vaporizer is used. You know, it's like, you know, you put it at three, put it at three, four, five, and that's very simple. And this whole calculation thing that Talmadge is elegant, uh, elegantly uh, displaying is not something that you have to play with every day. You just, uh, it's as simple as you push a button and it goes. A concept that in North America, anytime you want to give an infusion of propofol, it's not that simple. Yeah. Right? Uh, yes. I'm going to counter the, the argument that, that, that you know the vaporizer is easy because you've got a low flat, fresh fast flow. You got to you got to account for that, and so it's really hard to give a bolus of isofluorine or of sevofluorine <coughs> without doing a mental gymnastics and keeping in mind that you got to turn it on, turn off the turn off the flows, and you have to keep the flows on so for so long and or readjust based off that yeah. as opposed to hey, I'm just going to increase my TCI value and it bolus and reduces the off the flows. Certainly sort of some chances for error with uh, the vaporizer as well. You know, people have well, all kinds of crazy stories about people overpressuring for a time and then forgetting to bring it back down and, <laughs> and having a circulatory collapse as a result. Uh, yes, uh, then Axel. 
Can you give us your thought about Remy Mazalam and how it affects the future of TiVo? Sure. Should we, should we go to Remy Mazalam and the soft drug concept? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Why not? Uh, any more questions on this? Yes, maybe one. I'll just add, it, it wasn't that long ago that if you were using a copper kettle and you didn't have entitled monitoring, you were dealing, and that's kind of the age that we were in before TCI, right? Yeah. And TCI really is, I mean, it's unfortunate I'm from the you know, the states and we don't use it, but um, uh, that's really taking it to this next step where you can just turn the vaporizer and, and, and uh, have your effect. Yeah, yeah, we we can we're we're gonna get to to that topic. Uh, the, uh, There's one more we, question. Back yeah, here. that's right. I'm not sure this is. Uh, so, if you don't have a TCI technology, can you use entropy to guide uh, propofol uh, infusion? So, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think we can maybe get to that as the next topic. We'll talk about some of the gizmos and gadgets. That's the final faux cover there. Maybe talk about the use of the processed EEG as a means of personalizing the therapy. I think that's one of the things that can be quite helpful in, uh, in the bariatric surgery patients, trying to decide, wow, I don't know exactly how to dose this patient, uh, but I can at least be sure that the EEG is depressed appropriately. Yeah, so yeah, we... yeah, I just wanted to add on this. There, there, TCI is obviously a very complex mathem mathematical model. There are people who have simplified the zero order infusion reality in people that don't have TCI. And, and yeah, Boyk uh, in his paper on, on interactions uh, between opioids and propofol has some very, very simple infusion schemes in there that I use personally and I teach personally to my residents because we don't have TCI in my hospital. Yeah. So you know, there's ways to use Tiva differently than with all this computerized technology. Yeah. And we're going to talk about some apps in a few minutes that uh, also represent sort of passive TCI, right? Where you're, where you're still deciding what to do, but the app can guide you. All right. Should so we... is there uh, more than soft, uh, soft fentanyl, remifentanyl, and all that? Is there other drugs that we, uh, that we could use in yeah. our practice or that are coming? Yeah, so this is the concept of soft drugs. It's a really cool idea. And uh, this was one of my favorite f uh, fake covers. Um, I'll let you decide what flavor is which here. Um, <laughs> which one is Remy Fenton and which are some of these new soft drugs. The concept of a soft drug relates to this fundamental problem in anesthesia. And this is actually an editorial that, that uh, Kai Cook and I published uh, some time ago, summarizing this, this real challenge in anesthesia. So, in most therapeutic areas, again, let's suppose you're in an internal medicine office and you're treating patients with asthma and hypertension and angina and so on. So you've got two primary things you're thinking about in therapeutics. What's the safe dose and what's the effective dose? And we're, we're talking here about the dosing space in terms of the Venn diagram. And the nice thing in most therapeutic areas is that the safe dose and the effective dose, there's a lot of overlap. We call that a a high therapeutic index, right? In other words, you know, the, the really dangerous dose is many times more than the, than the effective dose. Now in anesthesia, not only do you have sort of a, uh, a, a problem where you have a narrower overlap between the safe dose and the effective dose, so this is just a little sliver, try putting on 3-MAC for very long and see what happens. Um, we have low therapeutic index drugs. But in addition, we have this other problem, and that is this efficiency problem. So in our specialty, it's not enough to be safe and effective. We also have to have the patient emerge quickly enough that we can move on to the next case, right? And this is, this is most specialties just don't deal with this. Most specialties, uh, if you treat a patient with a beta blocker for hypertension and, and later on you decide that therapy is not necessary and you stop it, the fact that it takes a few days for the complete dissipation of drug effect is no problem. In our specialty, you really have to be mindful of how we're going to wake this patient up uh, in a way that makes it so that we can have a 20-minute turnover time, right? So that's very tricky, very challenging. So this is a unique thing about anesthesia therapeutics. And it's this soft drug concept that, uh, that really attempted to address this 
from a pharmaceutical point of view. Now, there are other ways that we address this, this efficiency problem, like TCI, for example, and the processed EEG. So there are technologies that we use, but this, this was the drug solution. That's part of the overall solution. A soft drug, by definition, is a drug that is metabolically labile. That is, it, it has a very high clearance. It turns out that the body's capacity for esterase metabolism is extremely large. And esterases are expressed in most tissues. And so for a drug like remifentanil, even the hand is a metabolic organ, right? And so if you want to read a little bit about the, the soft drug concept, this is an editorial from some years ago that elaborated on it. So remifentanil is sort of the, the granddaddy of them all, although remember, succinylcholine was an example of this. And the, our short-acting beta blocker, esmolol, is an example of this, right? So we have uh, other soft drugs that are just not anesthetics, but we use them for other purposes. So this is remifentanil, and it's got two esters, but it's this ester that's the, the key. So this ester is metabolized by ester hydrolysis to this acid metabolite that's inactive. It's, of course, critical that this be inactive, uh, or we wouldn't have really gained anything. By the way, this ester is not metabolized because it's kind of sterically hindered in between these, these two groups. And so it's this ester that's dangling out for the, uh, for the enzyme. So remifentanil has proved to be quite useful as, uh, in, in promoting an on-off kind of situation, opioid. Although I want to remind you that in my view, the main reason to use remifentanil is not that it's short acting. That's actually a big disadvantage in many situations, right? The main reason remifentanil is useful is that you can get a steady state very quickly. So when you, when you change your infusion weight with remi, within 15 minutes, it's very close to a steady state. You know how long it takes fentanyl if you're giving it a fentanyl infusion? If you just change the infusion rate? You know how long it takes to get to a steady state? About a day about 24 hours. That's how different they are. So the nice thing about Remy is if you decide I need more opioid effect or less, you can get there quickly. That's what's good about it. Not so much that it goes away quickly. Anyway, so um, this is what I was just uh, alluding to. So this is if you just start an infusion at time zero, and this is the percent of, of peak steady state concentration. We have to normalize this to peak because all of these drugs have different potencies, so they would be all over the graph otherwise, right? So you can see that when you start an infusion of Remy, you know, within, within 50 minutes or so, you're, you're pretty much locked in. All these other drugs, they're going up. If you were infusing, they'd be going up the whole case. Now, we can get around this a little bit with boluses, right? You can give a bolus and then overshoot a little bit and then fall down on the concentration. And that's what we do with these other drugs. But this is a very useful property, and I think the primary useful property of Remy fentanyl. Anyway, what do we have coming in the way of soft drugs? Well, this is the one that's, uh, I'm, this is the one I have a conflict with because I consult with this company. So remimazolam is a midazolam-like molecule. You can see here that it's a chiral molecule. It's a single enantiomer drug. And this is the ester that is metabolized and inactivates the molecule. It, it's metabolized into this acid metabolite. So it's following the mold of remifentanil completely. This, drug was, this drug's uh, new drug application was just filed with the FDA. So uh, it might disappoint you to learn that this is being developed for procedural sedation. So it's really being developed for the GI market. Now, why are they doing that? That's an interesting thing to consider. If you start with anesthesia, like propofol did, and then you try to move it to GI, it's very difficult from a regulatory perspective. If you start with the target audience, GI sedation, and you develop it for that, then you don't have to, it, it'll be easy to move it to anesthesia, right? As soon as it's approved, anesthesiologists presumably will be able to use it. I don't know how quickly this will get approved, but I think it's quite likely to make it, and it'll be interesting to see it. I really have no idea how well it's going to, to, to do in the marketplace. It's not enough to get approved, right? You have to have market receptivity. It has to bring some value. So it'll be interesting to see where that lands. But this could potentially have, uh, be a disruptive technology to the GI sedation world. Right? And then here's another uh, group of those. This is uh, a soft etomidate analog. So Doug Rains at uh, MGH, he was here at this conference. Um, I used to consult with this company. I don't anymore um, because this, this development program is, is sort of on hold. So this is a 
an atomidate-like molecule. This looks very much like atomidate right here. That has this ester out here that is metabolized again to a, an acid metabolite. And uh, the nice thing about this is that it's a short-acting atomidate, and it also has much less depression of adrenal synthesis. And the reason is it just doesn't last as long. It's not around to depress that enzyme for as long. And by the way, you know what I learned as, as part of all of this is that it's this, uh, it's this nitrogen here that forms a coordination bond with the binding site of the adrenal synthesis, the adrenal steroid synthesizing enzymes. And so it, it competes for that enzyme active site. And that's why atomidate depresses adrenal function. So anyway, whether one of these will be able to emerge, because there are a whole series of these molecules that they have synthesized in Dr. Raines' lab, whether one of these will eventually come to the clinic, I think, is anybody's guess. But you can see that there's this kind of activity trying to develop these, the, the soft drug, advance the soft drug concept. OK. So there's, the, there's sort of the answer about um, Remy Maslam. So it's pretty far in development. It's all the way through uh, phase three trials and now is filed with the, with the FDA. Questions, comments, observations? Yes? I don't know how much GI you do, but Remy Maslam is an interesting idea as long as they can keep their hand off the fentanyl syringe. <laughs> which, is, which is the very hard thing for GI doctors who want to be anesthesiologists and who do not have never looked at the 59-page guideline that was developed for sedation in that, in that setting with the assistance of the anesthesiologists. The, 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 um, the American Society actually provided them with a lot of guidance and they produced this very nice manual. You can read it online and they don't look at it. Yeah. So I think the point you're raising is a good one. The the synergy between these sedatives and the opioids is quite powerful. And uh, you know the truth is that GI docs can get into as much trouble with midazolam and fentanyl as they can with propofol, right? And in some ways you could argue that propofol is actually safer uh, because it's it's shorter acting. And so if you get into trouble, you're a little bit more likely to be able to to recover. But anyway, interesting a problem and a and I think a very important point. Yeah. They do a ton of cases. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's an interesting controversy and problem uh, in in the United States in particular. Mm -hmm. Any other? So, gadgets, gizmos. What's new? What can you use? How can you have uh, fun with uh, the? Oh yes, sorry. We move on to this. Um, can you talk about uh, TIVA or intravenous anesthesia and cardiac surgery or cardiac cases? Because a little concern there have been now is at least one study, I think, was done in Cabbage, where they had people randomized to a, a vapor-based anesthetic versus uh, intravenous technique. And unfortunately, the intravenous technique uh, patients showed some of them had a higher rise in trompone. I think the outcomes <coughs> were not different. Now, the Brits have, I think, poo-pooed such uh, papers, but there have been other papers that show that if you are uh, prone to uh, coronary insufficiency, you may have uh, higher rises of components if you use profile-based anesthetics. The other thing is that the, uh, some of the vapor-based anesthetics seem to be cardioprotective. Yeah. Well, um, let me start by saying that I'm not a cardiac anesthesiologist. Uh, I do follow this literature a little bit. Uh, but not in great detail. And so I'm, I'm really not the right guy to ask, honestly. But I think what I can tell you is that there's certainly some controversy in this arena. There are uh, many centers that use TIVA for cardiac anesthesia uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, large outcome trial that clearly sort of shows which, which technique wins, right? One study that was just published last year, which was quite influential, is the fact that the, um, that the vapors are not associated with as much uh, ischemic uh, conditioning uh, as people had hoped. In fact, it was a negative trial. Um, and, and, and as a result, that one advantage, the idea that TIVA might be worse because there's some a preconditioning effect associated with the vapors, seems to be teetering now. So it'll be interesting to see where that lands. I think there are 
there are a lot of open questions there that, that have yet to be definitively addressed. Maybe if I can comment a little bit on that. The first study I did at, at Don's lab was trying to determine the pharmacokinetics of alfentanil in cardiac surgery for kids. That was a good introduction to PKPD, <laughs> actually. The model is extremely complex, and, and it, it would be near to impossible to put that into a pump and get to a stable level using a standard TCI technology. So uh, there's probably that the level that you get with any type of inhalational anesthesia is probably more stable than anything you can get with intravenous. Yeah, I mean, cardiopulmonary bypass is certainly very disruptive to the disposition of intravenous drugs. And mm. uh, the fact that you can put a vaporizer on a bypass machine um, is a much, is certainly a, an, an easier way mm. because again, you're just relying on physics. Uh, so there's some appealing things about inhalation anesthesia in the cardiac surgery realm. All right, questions? Okay, gizmos. So let's talk about gizmos and gadgets just for a second. So this is uh, one of those final covers here. Um, so this is kind of a Rube Goldberg machine of, of <clears throat> sorts. Um, and this is intended to introduce the idea of what technologies have arisen over the last several decades that have improved the practice of TIVA. And I think really chief among them uh, is the ability to personalize the therapy with the processed EEG. And I'm showing the BIS here, but there are now dozens of these available, uh, at least a half a dozen. And um, they, they all are, are sort of attempting to do the, th the same thing, and, and that is quantify the level of depression of the EEG. I must say that in my own practice, I have just sort of gotten to, um, to looking at the raw waveform, and I don't worry about the index so much. Indices in medicine are kind of problematic because they're, they're, they're unitless parameters. They're, they're according to some algorithm that's highly dependent on the uh, the data training set, the patients that it came from. Whereas anybody can look at the EEG, and I'm, I really believe this is true, anybody can look at the EEG and see whether it's depressed, see whether it's moved from an awake state to a, a sort of a natural sleep type state, because you're looking at these, these high amplitude, low frequency delta wave activities, activity, and it's quite readable, and you can learn how to do this in five anesthetics. And so I personally believe that that displaying the raw EEG will, in the not too distant future, become a standard monitor for us. But we'll have to see whether, uh, whether that's true. You can certainly get away without it, but the nice thing about the processed EEG, or the raw EEG, is that it gives you a way of deciding, okay, I based everything on a, on a model. I based everything on population sort of averages of what people should get but I don't know what this patient needs. And so this is a way of personalizing the therapy. Um, I'm curious of, to know how many of you just by raise of hand use, routinely use the processed EEG. So it's a minority, but it's certainly a substantial minority. I try to use it on essentially every general anesthetic that I do, but I'm a minority at our, at our institution. And you know, there is that incremental cost. It costs about 20 bucks to do it. Right, you gotta buy the electrode. So that's uh, something to think about. In the US, this is the best we've got. We've got so-called calculator pumps, right? So the calculator pumps uh, are quite functional, but they're not TCI. But they're much better than what we had back in the day. You know, Many of you remember in the early days, or some of you anyway, uh, that are as old as I am, you remember in the early days of TCI, it was, it was really quite painful to do TCI. You know, we didn't have good pumps and, and we didn't have good uh, infusion setups. Uh, sometimes you were having to use a, a cassette pump from the floor, not a syringe pump. And so these are, these are really quite functional. A couple of other things that I think are, are interesting. So this is a, a guidance system that is available from Draeger. It's called the Smart Pilot. And uh, this system is showing the predicted concentrations of remifentanil, and here's the predicted concentration 
I'm sorry, remifentanil here and propofol here versus time. This is showing how the drugs are behaving on a, what's called a response surface model. So these are, this is the uh, toleration of laryngoscopy. 90% of, of subjects should be tolerant of laryngoscopy if you've got these combinations. So here's propofol and remifentanil shown in terms of the, the pharmacodynamic interaction. And so these guidance systems are available. You know what's really interesting is these, I think these are cool, really cool. And in fact, we developed one just like this that we licensed to, uh, to GE. Ours looks a little different, but it's the same idea. So they're now available for both, both major anesthesia workstations. But you know what's interesting? They haven't had any uptick. You know, they've been a, a, a failure, basically. Why do you think that is? I'm very curious to, to know why you think that is. Why do you think? models are not ready. They are not externally validated. So we have lots of new models coming out who always claim that they are better than the previous one. Mm -hmm. But it stops there. We, we need to gather a new, new set of patients with new dense... And validate the models. You're absolutely right that the models are, are not perfect. Although, I, I, having done a lot of this work over the years, I have my doubts about whether we can get them to be much better. Um, it's always going to require uh, some adjustment in real time by the, by the practitioner. But, uh, but I think you're right, that people get disappointed in the, in the performance of the models. That's one, one issue. Any other, any other speculation about that? I think another matter is that the models are not very physiological. For instance, this new propofol model has very complicated functionals in the exponent. And it's really hard to understand why. Yeah. The one reason is that they are very data driven. Mm -hmm. So that might be one reason that they are then very data specific yeah. models and might not be utilized. Maybe not generalized as well. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that all also goes into it. My thinking, honestly, is that for a lot of people, this is beyond their training, right? Especially in North America. If we showed this to a North American, they'd go, well, okay. I kind of get this. I don't have any idea what this is. Um, so we, we really haven't done the training that's necessary for people to understand this stuff. It is advancing. It's coming along. But that's part of the problem, right? These are some apps that I think, there are many of these available now. And they're mostly available for free. This one's available for free. This is from Charles Minto and Thomas Schneider. So this is RemiSim, PropSim, and Fentasim. And you actually, this is what we would call passive TCI, meaning that you dial in what you've given, and then you get a digital readout of the concentration, and you also get a graphical display of the concentration versus time. Now, unfortunately, it's kind of cumbersome, right? You have to sort of stop and fiddle with it. It's a tremendous way to learn about, to develop intuition about the disposition of drugs, because you start to see the way they behave uh, in terms of the model predictions. But there are lots of these kinds of systems available, and this is part of the reason why I think these display systems have not been popular. They've been disrupted. They've been disrupted by free things, right, that are on your phone. So that's, that's part of the problem. I wanted to just quickly mention this because I think this is really a fascinating development. It's an old development now, and I'm sorry that it hasn't made more progress, but it's only because of technical challenges, uh, mostly related to miniaturization and expense. So this is the idea of measuring expired propofol. So what we have represented here is, here's a propofol molecule. And you can uh, use a, uh, a source to ionize the propofol molecule. And then you can send it through a detector, just like regular uh, mass spec and actually measure the expired propofol concentration. And how does this actually look? So this is from Dr. K Takeda almost 10 years ago now in Japan. And on the bottom here, we're showing the propofol infusion rates. And then this dotted line is the predicted propofol concentration based on a pharmacokinetic model. Then these lines are showing the actual measured concentrations at these steady state plateaus. And then this line is the breath to breath, up and down variability of the expired propofol. 
and it's doing pretty darn well. This is using a very special, highly sensitive mass spec technique that can measure the propofol in parts per billion because it's in the expired gas. It's just there in very low concentrations. Interesting to think about why the measured concentration is so much different when you have this high level of propofol going. And the answer is sort of getting back to physiology, right? You have an increase in West Zone 1. You have so much cardiovascular depression at these high levels that um, the only part of the lung, a, a bigger proportion of the lung is not ventilated. And as a result, the arterial concentration, well, the concentration in the venous blood of the, coming back to the lungs is, is higher than actually what's being expired. But this is a cool technology, and we'd have it, except that it's, it's been difficult to miniaturize it, and it's too expensive. But, you know, as these things go, people will keep working at it, and maybe we'll get there someday. But there are lots of these interesting technologies that have, that have supported TCI. Perhaps worth saying that there are also technologies now for measuring online propofol concentrations in arterial and venous blood. The, uh, the, Korea, the Korea, South Koreans have published it is not in mainstream literature, it's in analytical chemistry or something like that. Mm -hmm. The concentration range is right, the response time is slow. Yeah, that's interesting. There's also a technology from a company in the UK that's being used in ICUs uh, that is essentially a tabletop, a, a bench top system. It's about, it would fit on this little table, it's like a computer printer that you can get a venous sample of blood and inject it into this system and get a propofol concentration measurement in a couple of minutes. Uh, and it's called Yes. Uh, it's made by people in, as I described it, the other university town in the UK in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> um, it's quite good, actually. We've, we, we have used it in animals. So you can imagine uh, how that could be interesting in an ICU setting when you're sedating people um, and, and trying to see whether your propofol levels are getting, getting crazy or not. So, well, we're coming down the home stretch here, Pierre. Yeah, um, any more questions? We have a couple of, uh, unless you're tired, you know, you're free to, to go, I guess. If you <laughs> <laughs> but there's a couple of other things that uh, I would like uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, pick your brain about. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, Tiva is that Tiva is green. So that's an interesting question. How many of you are, uh, have green initiatives as part of your perioperative services? So our Swedish visitors do. Um, somewhere in the US, where are you practicing? I practice in Vanderbilt, but uh, James Berry, who has recently moved to Dallas, has actually come up with a scavenging system to recycle sevoflurane. Uh, it's a coal trap that I think the, the Swedes, the Finns, have actually adopted in some places. And uh, so there, That's fascinating to hear. Are ways to, there are ways to get it back. He's also looking at taking, taking bags of urine and retrieving, retrieving drugs that way. But I, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, the gas I can't wait That's to hear how name. those drugs are going to be yeah. named. <laughs> That's what we call generic. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, fascinating to hear. Pump in the basement that, uh, that you know you get this stuff back and uh, purifying it involves a molecular sieve. It comes back at around a third of the cost of manufacturing it. Mm -hmm. So wow. very very interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting development, uh, which will counter some of what I was about to say. Go ahead. We've been using in our hospital for more than ten years a recovery system for inhalational agents that was uh, <clears throat> invented in Canada. Um, and it uh, basically adsorbs molecules, so we, uh, we uh, use the exhaust gases and pass them through canisters. These canisters are picked up uh, in high heat environment. These uh, molecules are boiled off <clears throat> and then recaptured. It's been, because of the regulatory process in Canada, taken years and years to get these drugs licensed for reuse. Uh, 
but it's actually a technology that in our hospital we've had these canisters on our machines for at least 10 years. That's fascinating. I'm so pleased to hear that. Uh, so is it a distillation process by which they're recovering these? or? I'm not intimately connected with that. I actually know the, 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 the person who has developed this technology and has basically devoted her life to it. And these canisters are taken and put in a very high heat environment which basically boils the molecules off. And uh, so it's, it's probably a distillation type thing, but that they are then purified to the uh, level that is required by regulatory authorities to sell these as drugs that can be used in humans. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating, and we clearly need that technology given the popularity of inhalation anesthesia mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the environmental implications of it. I think the biggest barrier to using it is, the, in some ways, the added cost. Um, I, I think it's been licensed now to one of the um, gas meat machine manufacturers, uh, <clears throat> and the thing is that these canisters have to be uh, picked up, taken to a facility where they're processed, uh, but um, they, they are very efficient. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. This is a general comment. Um, so, also from Vancouver, where we do care about the environment quite a bit. Um, we had lots of discussions around changing which inhaled agent we use based on its um, ozone depletion potential and those kind of things. But now people have also become worried about the fact that if you use total intravenous anesthesia, you obviously use a plastic syringe. You now inject the leftover propofol into this magic porous material thing so it can be disposed instead of ending up in a landfill or in the water or whatever. So it's not a as clear cut as you might think in terms of yeah. what's the better thing? I think it's true that we don't have yet um, the kind of total sort of ecological footprint that we need for, for TIVA techniques. Um, Girish. So that was my question. We know now propofol is exhaled out. What does propofol, exhaled propofol, have any effect on the ozone or similar to the inhaled sex? on the environment. Yeah, I think the answer to that is probably no, and the reason is the, the amount that's in there is quite small, but, but I, I can't speak authoritatively about that because I, I just don't know the answer. Um, I thought I'd share with you just briefly uh, some of the data relating to um, this Tiva being green question. Uh, there are a lot of people that are quite interested in this. I think one of the lead thinkers is a woman named uh, Jody Sherman at Yale. We had her as a visiting professor at the University of Utah not too long ago. Um, and there are others that are quite interested. This was featured on the U.S. National Public Radio about two weeks ago, so it's starting to gain some traction. And here's the bottom line. The, the inhaled agents are troublesome uh, in terms of, of, of climate change and greenhouse because of two things. One is that uh, nitric, uh, nitrous oxide accumulates in the stratosphere and, and, and is an ozone destroyer. So that's one uh, element of this. And then the other is that in the troposphere, which is lower down, uh, the inhaled agents collect there and they, they absorb a lot of energy that is reflected from the Earth. So one of the main ways that the Earth cools itself is that the the radiant energy from the sun hits the Earth, and a lot of it is reflected back out into space. And what a greenhouse gas is, is a gas that, instead of let, letting that energy escape, instead of letting that radiant energy go, it uh, absorbs the energy. And if you look at, well, this is a very complicated graph, and it has some you know, very interesting units here, but, but the bottom line is that uh, this is showing you the various wavelengths of light, and this is showing you the absorption spectra of some of our inhalation agents. And it turns out that it's sort of right in this so-called atmospheric window. And this shows that at these certain wavelengths, uh, our inhalation agents are absorbing a lot of that, that spectral energy. And so this is, this is why they behave as greenhouse gases. It's that nitrous oxide destroys ozone and that the inhalation, the other uh, halogenated agents act as a greenhouse gas. So this is the sort of the final look at this. This is comparing uh, inhalation versus TIVA in terms of its carbon footprint. So we're not used to looking at these, and I want to just remind you, I'm not a, 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 an ecologist or a climatologist, and 
I've only familiarized myself with this stuff quite superficially from our anesthesia literature. But um, this is again from the work of Jody Sherman. This essentially is a way of normalizing a carbon footprint in terms of CO2 units, so to speak. And what, what we're showing here is the impact of desflurane, isoflurane, sevoflurane, propofol for a given sort of length of an anesthetic, a typical anesthetic. And the red part is what happens with, as a result of the nitrous oxide release. So you can cut, if you don't use nitrous oxide, you, you pull this impact back quite a bit. And then this is showing the greenhouse gas effect of the, of the inhaled agents. And then the blue is the rest of the carbon footprint, the manufacturing, the shipping, and so on. And you can see the propofol just has this simple little blue slice. You can barely see it compared to the inhaled drugs. So as it currently stands, unless you have a system that is recovering these inhaled gases, um, TIVA is quite a bit greener than the inhaled techniques. Axel. I wonder if we should wrap up here. Just a comment on uh, wondering if this, this data is based on fresh gas flows in general around the globe or metabolic rate or yeah. because so, I, mean, I think this is, this is based on recommended fresh gas flows. And Jody has published a lot of work in this and she's quite enthusiastic. She sort of, this is her mission in life is to try to make anesthesia greener. And so you might want to look at some of the literature that she's published. She's qu published quite a bit recently. <clears throat> she's collaborating with some environmental engineers at Yale. And so they're doing this in a very sophisticated way. Well, Pierre, I wonder if we should go to our report card. That's right. Because 4 o'clock is tea time, right, uh, John? <laughs> Let's see mm -hmm. if I can get there. I am discombobulated a little bit because I'm pressing the, the wrong buttons here. So let's see what we can do. I need to get to, these are some, these are some pieces that we didn't, we didn't wander into. If you go to your last uh, gizmos and gadgets and then go from there. There we go. Yeah. So uh, I thought I would just give a report card and I wanna just warn everybody, I'm doing this quite tongue in cheek as we say in uh, in American English. I don't know if the Canadians say that. You do. Um, I don't know what they would say in, in uh, Sweden. Uh, do you say tongue in cheek? But what I mean is, you know, I, I'm really sort of half joking about these because I'm trying to make a point, uh, make an argument. Uh, so I've entitled this the report card Tiva versus the Stone Age. <laughs> and again, I'm really just sort of kidding. But these are some fundamental differences. So. Um, do all of these techniques give you the oblivion that patients want? You know, really our social contract with the patients for a general anesthetic is oblivion. What they want is to not have any knowledge, both in real time and in retrospect, after the case, that, that any trauma has happened to them. And uh, I think it's fair to say that both TIVA and inhalation techniques work quite well for those. Um, the, the regional blocks don't do the trick. And we've included regional in here because that, of course, is part of the decision making, right? There's always the question of should we do a, a regional block? How about a euphoric emergence? I think this is an element of TIVA that is not very well studied, but is widely understood by practitioners. People wake up from TIVA typically in a different kind of way. They're a little bit more euphoric, a little calmer, not always. And certainly you sometimes get that kind of wake up from an inhaled agent, but I'm just curious, how many of you agree with me on this? Does TIVA have a unique quality of emergence? Well, propofol, and, you know, obviously when we talk about TIVA, we're really talking about propofol and something, right? Yeah, so good point, uh, Eli. But anyway, so I think this is something that we don't have a lot of data that we can point to, but I think this is widely appreciated by anesthesia practitioners. Uh, nausea and vomiting, there's no question. We didn't talk about this. We had a little segment that we could have visited, but TIVA is clearly the best thing to prevent post-operative nausea and vomiting, along with some anti-emetics, right? We have very strong data demonstrating that that's true. And in fact, the vapors, according to a recently published meta-analysis in the British Journal, the vapors are an independent risk factor for post-operative nausea and vomiting. So 
this is another important advantage. Is Tiva modern, sexy, and cool? I think the answer is yeah, it is cool. And it honestly, it requires a little bit more uh, clinical science than I think. We've spoken many times today about how you can turn around and just turn that vaporizer on, right? And it sort of uh, doesn't require a lot of brain power to do that. And there's a lot of science that's, that's sort of accumulated that undergirds TIVA that has made it quite a intellectually uh, challenging and interesting thing to do. And so I think it is a little bit more modern, sexy, and cool, although I grant you people can disagree. Does it always work? Well, TIVA always works as long as you have an IV, <laughs> right? But, and of course, sometimes you don't have an IV, and sometimes you lose an IV. So that's, a, that's definitely a disadvantage. One of the nice things about inhalation anesthesia is that the delivery system is a little more reliable, right? We have, endotracheal tubes don't come out that often, and IVs uh, have trouble with some frequency. And there's also all of the redundancy that we have with the airway integrity, right? We've got CO2 monitoring, and we have pulse oximetry, and we have low pressure and low volume alarms. So there's a lot of redundancy that confirms that that delivery system is still there. Uh, it's mostly to confirm that you're delivering oxygen, but the anesthetic tags along, right? But <clears throat> there's a, a notable example here. There are times when you just can't do this, right? I'm talking about malignant hyperthermia cases, right? That's one example. Also talking about airway surgery, where you just can't reliably deliver the inhaled agent, right? You're having to do jet ventilation or something. So TIVA really is uh, it's universal as long as you can get an IV. And if you have to, you can do an intramedullary infusion, right? You can, you, can, you can always get access to the circulation. I think it's fair to say that blocks uh, are not so good in this regard. The failure rate for blocks is it's, it's, it's certainly higher than these other two techniques. Right? Applies to any operation. Same sort of concept. We can't block everything. Um, we can't do certain kinds of operations, again, airway surgery and, uh, and other times where the delivery of the inhaled agent is challenging or contraindicated. Is it good for post-op pain? Well, gases are really not good for post-op pain, right? In fact, they have, ant they, they have uh, properties that are actually um, sort of antagonizing all of your efforts to produce pain relief. Whereas there's actually uh, some interesting papers that I view as sort of unconfirmed reports still, but there's some interesting small studies that show that the early postoperative pain management after TIVA is better than after vapor. And it's, it's presumably due to these anti-analgesic properties of the vapors at low concentrations. But I view that as sort of an unconfirmed hypothesis. Certainly blocks are very good for postoperative pain management. Environmentally green. Well, I gave them an F, but based on the comments from the audience, I've now learned that maybe we can give them a D. <laughs> I'm, I'm very glad to hear that, by the way, that there's a lot of work being done to try to make the vapor anesthetics more environmentally responsible, because that would be a good thing for our world, and uh, especially given the popularity of the techniques. A promising future? You know, I. Ted Eager told me on several occasions that he didn't think we'd ever get another inhaled agent. I'm not sure whether that prediction is going to be true, but it's, we're certainly not seeing much activity along those lines. Whereas in the intravenous world, we've got all this stuff happening. All these new drugs that we're trying to get across the finish line, all of this new technology, display systems, TCI, all this, this new modeling, trying to understand drug behavior. And so I, I think that there's quite a bright future for TIVA in terms of innovation. Go ahead. Well, Xenon, yeah, Xenon um, is, is certainly an interesting one. And, um, but, but Ted was sort of counting that one as ha having already arrived, right? And it'll be interesting to see Xenon's fundamentally different because it's an NMDA antagonist. So it's, it's not working the same way as the, as the halogenated vapors work. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you've got you to find the xenon and you've got to recover it. Uh, but there are, interesting, there are interesting work going on there. <laughs>
And in fact, uh, there was time not too long ago, uh, in fact, I was, when I was uh, doing a sabbatical in London, uh, Mervyn Mays and I were going to try to work on this, uh, potentially an intravenous uh, delivery system for, uh, for Xenon. But that never really got off the ground. So inter interesting possibilities, but I do think that it's fair to say that in, in the scale of sort of, uh, in, in the longitudinal sort of march of time, it's fair to say that the inhalation stuff is sort of firmly established and is, is older, and the Tiva stuff is newer and has a little brighter future in terms of innovation. Girish. IV inhalant site. Also, there was a great poster at this meeting uh, looking at isofluorine nanoparticles. Very interesting idea. And I can't say that I have any expert knowledge about that at all, other than to, to say that I know that it's, it's being examined. And it'll be. That group from Chengdu are also doing a lot of work in that area. Yeah, fascinating stuff. I, 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 as I say, I think we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. But it is an interesting idea. Honestly, I don't quite understand the rationale fully uh, because we already have these ubiquitous, very reliable delivery systems. And so I don't quite understand. It's, it's an interesting curiosity, but I don't quite understand w w why we, we want to develop that. So that's a, a, a reported benefit. Well, that's interesting to learn. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think one of the challenges with any new anesthetic drug is that from a drug company standpoint, it's a relatively small market. And that some of the things that might be driving the uh, development of drugs in Tiva is if you can get the gastroenterologists using it or some other specialties where your market's much bigger, um, the cost of developing a new drug, as you know, is enormous. And so the, the return on investment for a, a, pharma, a pharmaceutical company it, it is much better if there's a wider market. And for inhalational agents, Besides anesthesia, there's no other market. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. We are a small market, and that's why we're a little bit of an orphan specialty. Think about how many new drugs we've had in the last 30 years. You know, there's remifentanil and dexmedetomidine. There's desflurane. Sugamidex is the, is, the, is the most notable one from the, most, from the recent past. But it's not like we get a new drug every two or three years like some specialties do. And most of that is because we're not a... a a big market. In fact, it's interesting, for a big pharma, talking about the, the, the companies that are actually capable of developing a new chemical entity, if it's not going to, if it doesn't predict to yield 400, 500 million a year, they don't even think about it. They don't even think about it. And so that's part of the problem we have in our specialty. Well, we got to wrap up, but I have, I think, just a few more. These are what I think some of the unresolved issues. Which technique is going to be better for cancer surgery? A lot of great work going on in this arena. A guy named Donald Buggy. Isn't that an awesome Irish name? Donald Buggy at University College Dublin um, is conducting the, the sort of the multicenter trials that are going to really answer this question. Uh, also, the question of uh, is inhalation or, or uh, TIVA going to be better for the neurotoxicity in kids? We don't have any signals to suggest that one will be better than the other, but it'll be interesting to see what we learn about that. And then this preconditioning question, well, I think sort of got answered a little bit last year, but we'll need some confirmatory studies. So there are questions that are still are sort of still up in the air. So how much progress have we made as we uh, come in on 4 o'clock? Well, a lot. And I think it's fair to say that TIVA is a viable alternative to inhalation and anesthesia. And I don't want to leave you the impression that I think inhalation and anesthesia is somehow bad. I've tried to, to sort of take the TIVA corner to make the case. But uh, obviously, these are both very viable, uh, great techniques to anesthetize patients. And I think TIVA really does compete very favorably with inhalation anesthesia now. So I'll finish with getting back to my, the drawing that I had done by my beautiful illustrator uh, friend. And by that, I mean he's a, he's a beautiful illustrator, not a beautiful guy. Um, um, anyway, John Kilborn, my, my good friend, who's a very capable artist, drew this. And uh, who's the winner of this bout between TIVA and inhalation anesthesia? Well, I'll let you guess. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's been very interesting. I learned a lot. And I want to thank uh, Pierre. Yeah. Uh, you know, Pierre stood in for Dinesh Gupta, and it was very nice of him to do that. He did it with about 30 minutes' notice. So thank you, Pierre. <laughs> thank you.